Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader uh, here on uh, hosted by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, our guest is Stuart Onan, author of Ocean State which will be released on the 15th of this month by Grove. Stewart's award-winning fiction includes Snow Angels, A Prayer for the Dying, Last Night at the Lobster, and Emily Alone, amongst tons of others, and lots of nonfiction, my favorite being Faithful, a book co-written uh, with him by Stephen King. And it's about the 2004 Boston Red Sox series, which is unforgettable. And my favorite thing about the series was in bottom of the ninth, there was no way that Boston was coming back from a 3-0 deficit. And then in the most Stephen Kingian way, a dumbass sports reporter goes up into the stands, shoves a mic in front of Stephen King's face and says, well, what do you think about them losing four straight? And he goes, they're not losing four straight. They're going to win the World Series. And it was <laughs> bottom of the ninth, you know, uh, and it couldn't, it couldn't possibly happen. And then I went to Boston in early 2005 and both the Red Sox and the Patriots had won the championships. And it was the happiest place I'd ever been. It was like being in heaven. People were so <laughs> nice and pleasant. It was, it was just great. Um, enough of me. So last time I was just talking to Stuart, we talked about uh, both Last Night at the Lobster and Emily Alone. Uh, and they were published four years apart. But somehow we got talking about both of them. And I thought it was a great interview. So Ocean State. Uh, in the first line, we learned that a high school student was murdered and we found out who did it. And the first question I ask would be the first question that everybody will ask in any interview and written about in any review. So the story that unfolds from there is one that figures out not what happened, because we know, but how it happened and the lives that changed because of it. And there's lots of spoilers, therefore, that I'll stay away from. So it's told in a sense by our women at its heart, Angel the murderer, Carol, her mom, and Bertie, the victim. They all meet us and we come to know them as they converge in a climax, both, uh, I guess, tragic and inevitable, moving in a kind of tandem to a resolve, if you will. And our Virgil on this trip to hell is Marie uh, in hindsight. And we're in working class Ashaway, Rhode Island, and we stay there, breathing it in. And the ending, I don't know, closure, I don't know, closure. I don't know, is kind of like the ending of Lobster in the sense that after the last page, we're left wondering about a bunch of things, which is what every reader should feel, I think, after any book. And Stuart does that better than I think than most. So hi, Stuart, right. thanks for joining us again. Thanks so much, Sam, it's very kind of you. So what's gonna happen with baseball this year? Uh, uh, so dumb, so dumb, you know? Um, hey, the owners are just being greedy, that's all. Um, I had tickets to opening day against the Cardinals here in Pittsburgh, and no, nope, it's not going to happen. So I know, and the, they make a big point of saying the players will not be paid. I mean, okay, great. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. It's no. it never has all these different ones, you know. And you got all these asterisk seasons that should never have happened, but be that as it may, it's you know, it's 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 business, you know, and it, it's it's and it's power. You know, who, who has the power and who doesn't have the power? And, you know, it's typical. Yeah, I mean, spend half my life saying power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, whether you're a dog catcher or a king. Well, I, I think in the old days, we thought that, you know, like the Supreme Court, that the commissioner was supposed to be there for the good of the game as a whole, rather than to be on one side, rather than to be an advocate for the people already in power. Um, and that's that's definitely changed. Yeah. Like my dad said, money changes everything. Um, so anyway, so you certainly didn't bury the lead. Um, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't my first question because we talked about baseball. So, but everybody else will start with that question is mysteries, thrillers, what have you, they don't start that way. So you must have, what, the, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, well, I, I think, and, and it's funny that the, that that's the frame of it because 
every mystery that we have, the solution to the mystery is less interesting than the actual mystery itself. If you think of something like, you know, the big sleep, you know, the actual finding out who done it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, is really not that interesting. It, it's it's just a it's just a, a puzzle, and that that puzzle is is minor and kind of a tired form, I think. And we've seen that so many times. What's more interesting, as you said, is the effect on everybody around, the consequences. And I see so much in, in, in pop culture, in, in film and in TV and in, in books where the consequences really aren't discussed or gone into at all. And there are consequences to these things. Um, and so I think Ocean State is, it's a bit of a, a cautionary tale um, of, you know, what, what actually happens. It is, it is a realism and almost kind of a super realism in a way as you know these people do these things they're not going to get away with them they are going to destroy the people around them and their lives and that's going to happen it's going to come down on them and i think from the beginning when you have someone who is a villain or a villainous character or a character who has done something wrong we want to see that justice we want to see it play out um and i want to say that more times than not in life that actually does happen people do not get away with these kind of things um, they, they are found out. There may be a small, small percentage that, that do get away with them, but, but not many, and certainly not many teenagers. No, and, and the problem is because of their emotions, what they do right after they do it, they know they're not going to get away with it, yeah. like, you said, like Saturday Night Specials. Well, that, that extends to all the characters, I think. They, they know that what they want isn't quite right, right? Even the mother, even Carol. You know, and trying to sort of snare this guy Russ so she can have a more stable life just because she's you know poor and he's got some money there. Um, what we desire is not always what we should. I think is is, is one of the, the sort of the big, you know, guiding lights of this particular book. And what love does to us, what love makes us do, what what you know how how love makes us feel our own power, but also leaves us powerless at times. That 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 strange, you know, paradox. How did you? Look, I mean, you're getting old and you're all white, man. I'm older. How did you get the voices? How did you get the voices of these adolescent girls, one of who's like middle school girl? How did you? And it, they're so true because I know <clears throat> with my stepdaughter, my daughters, I know you got it right. But how Thanks. did you get it right? Um, well, I, originally it was going to be a, a novel about just the two sisters um, and, and their relationship through this very strange period in their lives. So I, I spent several years just sort of mulling that over and saying, how do I get this finally onto the page? What form is it gonna take? What structure does it need? You know, who's gonna be my point of view where? Um, and, and, and in doing that, I wrote a lot of false starts that, that helped me sort of, I guess, rehearse the voice, especially the voice of Marie, because I knew Marie had to be the heart of the book. Um, she is the, she's the, the the overlooked one. She's the invisible one. She says that, and I think on the very first page, when I stood next to her in church, I was invisible. You know, and how does it feel to be invisible? Which is, uh, I, I think I, I, I touch on that in a lot of my more recent books. When you think about, say, Emily Alone or uh, Last Night at the Lobster, how does it feel to be invisible in our culture at large? And Marie is completely invisible, even in her own family, and she's used to it. And so she becomes, as she says in her own narration, a spy. Uh, she's keeping tabs on everything. She's keeping account of everything. Any unkindness, she 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 carries it with her, and that's how she. In the end of the story, you know, she carries the story forward, you know, throughout her life. She's stuck with it, which is which is her kind of private hell. Yeah, she carries the story forward by looking at it backwards, you know. Yeah. And you know, I was gonna, I was not gonna say that, but the other reviews do say that. They say hindsight, and. Yeah, so it is hindsight. When did you decide to switch that from the pre did you or that was just always going to be it was, it was always going to be a retrospective narrator because it is about the loss of innocence. So it is that coming of age story. It's Marie's coming of age. It's when she understands what's true, what's real, what actually happens. Um, it's when she learns about love. It's when she learns about the bonds of family. It's when she learns about the world and the law there. So it had to be retrospective. It's her looking back and trying to make sense of it. And of course, you know, like Arthur and Snow Angels, he can look back, but he'll never be able to make sense of it. And so he, he's doomed to tell it over and over, trying to get closer and closer. 
And so there's that structure where we open up in the first person. So we know it's, it's Marie's book. Um, and then we go to the third person and there's sort of an implicit and unsettling feeling that actually Marie may be narrating these as well uh, without having to go out and be overt about it. There's almost an implicit mapping um, of herself onto the narration and into the other characters. Um, and she can say things about herself when she's narrating from the third person that she doesn't dare say in the first person. It's almost like there's two different Maries. They're an inside and an outside one. That idea of private thought and then public speech and, and the gap, the irony between the two. So I had a lot of fun with it. It's funny because I was just thinking, yeah, you learn a lot about everybody, but it's not Joycean. You're not going through the interior monologue ever. And and it's funny because it all, you know, lots of times I think about lobster because I always think of it as a, a not no, not a tragedy at all, but it's a heroic book. And you have an Arthurian mm -hmm. Lancelot hero in a context <laughs> where I mean, really, I mean, he's such a hero, and yet he's in this most plebeian prosaic. Well, he's, he's he's Quixote if Quixote were played by Sancho Panza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't want to go back. I'm not going back to that, but I, that was that was such a great book because you didn't you. even from the beginning, you didn't think this is what it was going to be like that this you were going to really admire this guy as someone I would like to be like this man. Anyway, um, so what I was going to ask, I guess, was. And oh, yeah, I told you I moved. So when I moved, I found my report card from sixth grade, which was <laughs> horrible because it was all. Sam doesn't live up to his potential. Sam commits oh. careless errors, blah, blah, blah. It was, and it was always the same. And I thought that way about Angel. She had a lot of potential, you know? But Well, yeah. she's also, she's cursed with that as well. I mean, she's the firstborn. She's the one that looks exactly like her mother, right? They could be twins in that old photograph. Um, and they, expect, they expected a lot of her mother and her mother failed. And now that that failure has fallen on Angel, where she's supposed to succeed too, but she sees no way to to succeed. Um, and she understands that. She understands she's going to be stuck here in Ashaway and Westerly, while all of her friends, all of her, her senior friends at the high school, they're going to go on to universities. They're going to leave the town, and she's kind of just stuck here. There, and that kind of drives her as well, because this is the most powerful she's ever going to be um, in her life, and she sees that sort of slipping away. Um, and, and when she's undermined by um, Miles and Angel and Miles right. and Bertie getting together, um, she's lost all of her power and she doesn't know what to do. And the only way she, she knows what to do is to fight back with the only powers that she has. Um, and, and she does terrible, terrible things. Um, and even sadder than that to me was the fact that, and this happens all the time, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, that Marie, is still looking up uh, to Angel and being very sad that she can't meet the standards that in terms of body, in terms of face. And so she has to turn to other things, which lots of girls do, to satisfy that hole, that gap inside of her. And that's very well done too. Thank you, thank you. Well, I mean, that, that's her, I mean, from the beginning, it was gonna be the two girls and, and how one is trying to model herself after the other and can never live up to her. Um, and, and she doesn't know how to be a person. She looks at her mother and, and that role model falls flat for her. And she looks at, at Angel and she says, you know, that's what I want to be. Her whole hope is that you will magically become her, right? And then she turns out to be, you know, this horrible person. And then she just doesn't know what to do. Um, so she's, she's in, in a way she's she's rather destroyed. She never she never fully becomes the person Marie, the person that she could be, in a way. And she ends up stuck there. And actually, everybody else leaves. Um, she's the one that they think you know she might do the best. She might get out of there and do something, but she's there forever. She's a lifer there. I mean, one of the last images is her looking out her classroom at the graveyard where her grandparents are buried and saying, "This is where I belong." Yeah, and mopping the same floor that has been mopped by her family for 50, 60 years. But in it's that sense, I mean, she does come to accept some personhood, uh, but that personhood is the one passed down from family, which a, a lot of us do, right? And you can't run from blood. And she rationalizes it too. She said, this is, she says, this is what I want. This is where I am. I'm not 
a spinster. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm not a witch. Work. Yeah. But it's funny. Isn't it funny how like when you're a kid, these lots of your friends, you think they're going to go places. Not that you have to go places, but they end up never leaving. Even if the place they started in is not that cool, not that much fun. They just, And they end up never leaving. They're there their entire lives from birth to death. I always well, wonder. I mean, coming from Pittsburgh, totally understandable. Right. I mean, I, most people from Pittsburgh end up in Pittsburgh anyway, um, like like me. Here I am. Uh, um, it is it is a, a provincial novel. Right. And a lot of my novels are what you could call in the old days, say the 19th century, the provincial novel. I mean, I, I take as my subject, not, you know, the glories of Brooklyn or Manhattan or, or Hollywood. But I, I'm looking at, I guess, you know, the rest, if it's in the category of the rest of the United States. Um, where the rest of us live there. So uh, my, my territory is Pennsylvania, upstate New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, kind of in between places, flyover country in, in a way, even though it's on, in the East. Um, so again, that idea of what's overlooked, what are the stories that I think are important to tell and that are not getting uh, the attention that, that say, you know, a lot of other subjects and a lot of other characters are getting a lot, a lot of play and have been for the past you know, 45 years. Um, Marie, I mean, if you ask Marie if she had anything to say, she'd say no. <laughs> she had nothing going on, you know, just working. You know? And, yeah. and, and those, those are my characters. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not flashy. No, yeah, you're right. It's kind of 19th century, a Jane Austen or something like that, where you're not going to go farther than your horse and carriage can take you any time in your life, you know? And, and, and your family, you know? Right. Uh, you know, what, what, is, what are your expectations? What are you supposed to be? You know, uh, who are you supposed to be? Um, and I, I think we all have to live with that. Um, very, very few people get, you know, get that escape velocity out of that orbit. We, yeah, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really invent ourselves. I think, and that, that's one of the, the, you know, the American, uh, I guess the American ideals is that we can be anything we, we want to be. Um, but when you look at your, your parents and the people closest to you and your friends and your, your family, not, not so, not really. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of like, not that it is in your case or many cases, but sometimes it's fear. It's like Ethan Frome. I always thought, why doesn't Ethan just leave with his love, just take off? I mean, he has, he, there's nothing keeping him there. He doesn't have to get on a sled and he could just, he could just leave. And I'm thinking, you know, but it's he doesn't hard. Know, he doesn't know anything else though. He doesn't right. know anything. This is his world. Um, it's, it's very rare for people to jump from one world into another, wholly into another. Very, very rare. Um, and usually that other world will draw them back in eventually anyway hey so um there were a lot of things oh yeah so marie so she turns almost in a romantic sense again like lots of girls and guys do uh to food and you you talk a lot about food and what she gravitates toward and she doesn't want to and she loathes herself for doing it but it's something we see or read about almost all the time right i mean well that idea of desire and what do we actually desire and that, that feeling of satiation or fullness um, that she doesn't have in any other part of her life. Um, her life is relatively empty. She's left alone a lot. She has very little to turn to. She has, she has you know, almost no friends. Um, her mother's at work most of the time. You know, Angel's off doing whatever Angel does. And Maria is left to somehow you know, grow up and get along. Um, she's, she's that sort of ultimate latchkey kid. She's got a latchkey for a house that's you know, falling down in a row of houses that have already fallen down. Um, no, but she's, she's our, in a weird way, she's our, our heroine. Yes, she is. There's nothing wrong with her. She's a good person. And you know what? Birdie's a good person too. At least I think. There's... Yeah, she, she's not a bad person just in, in, the, in the throes of love. She's forgotten who the people, who are the most important people to her. She's forgotten you know, her mother a fair amount. She's, she wants to get away from her mother and just go out and be with Miles. So she's forgotten her best friend, you know, Elena, 
Um, she's like, you know, she's not telling Elena everything. Like in the past, she would tell everything, but this is so important that Bertie wants to keep all this to herself. It's hers. It's totally fulfilling. Um, and it, it's that it's that ecstasy and misery um, that that kind of romantic love, you know, brings us. And, and how do we how do we balance those things? And isn't it strange that you know, that, that thing that can exalt us the most can also debase us the most. Yeah, and she reproaches herself internally every time she does, makes one of those decisions. Oh, and she, she knows, she knows she shouldn't be doing this. Well, I think, I think most of the characters in the book understand they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, but they do it anyway. I mean, even, even Marie with the pizza. She knows she's time and again, she knows that you know, she shouldn't do this. And yet there she is, you know, just shoving it in her face. Um, yeah. What we desire is not always what we should. No, I've been there <laughs> with pizza. I don't know if it's the same thing, but I'm definitely there with pizza. Oh, uh, yeah, it's like, and if you're looking, just, I, lo I love to look at characters and say, okay, is this a good person? Is this a bad person? And like Miles, I, okay, I immediately want to hate him because he's the reason things happen without saying anything more, but he's not, he's not really a bad person either. Kind of. I, you know, I, I think at one point after they've been through a lot, um, Angel turns to him in the car and says, you know, you're, you're a dick who can be an asshole. You know, and this, this is the boyfriend that she's fought as hard as possible to keep. He turns to him and says, only partly jokingly, you're a dick who can be an asshole because was because he thinks because they know that he's slept around on on angel he says everyone thinks i'm a dick you know and then she has to add that he can also be an asshole <laughs> so yeah i mean he's 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 careless he's thoughtless he's inconsiderate um he's insensitive he's a teenage boy yeah um, he's a teenage boy who thinks that everyone is going to love him and guess what they do um, and then what he does with it is what every teenage boy does with it, which is he, he totally, you know, squanders it, wastes it. Um, yeah. yeah. It's funny. I guess if you look at the best person in the book, it's Russ. But, but I don't want to go out with a woman who lives in a nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, Russ, Russ has his own desires and they're kind of very straightforward in a way. Uh, but he's, Russ is the steadiest person in the book. Russ oh, knows yeah. who he is. Russ knows exactly who he is. He has no illusions. Um, and Russ is going to try to help everyone that he cares for, which is, which is amazing, uh, I think. Um, I, I think Carol, the mother, is trying. I mean, she's, she's trying as much as she can. But again, she makes poor choices. Uh, with men, which she's, you know, from the beginning, she's made bad choices with men. Um, when she chooses to stay with Wes, um, even though she's broken up with him, or to keep, you know, you know, seeing Wes, even though she's seeing Russ at the same time. Um, yeah, and she's in a tough position. Um, she's in a very, very tough position. And there, she, like, like Angel, she doesn't see many ways out there, and she knows she has to get out. Um, she understands that things have already gone wrong, and there's only a few more chances to sort of save herself and her girls. And she will sacrifice herself for her girls. Um, she just needs to find a way to do it where it's actually going to work. Um, and sadly, you know, it's, it's, it is too late for her. She just doesn't understand that it actually is too late um, for Angel. It's interesting how they handle the difficulties that they partially create for themselves. And one thing that I wondered about, and I have to be careful here that I'm not giving anything away, is that in the end, when there are all kinds of issues coming up, I was really surprised that Carol and um, the grandmother and Wes, they weren't more upset. It was like with regard to the attorney and his suggestions for doing things. And they were kind of like, okay, yeah, do this. But they weren't, it wasn't like, it was horrible, you know? It was like, yeah, okay, just do this. Yeah, yeah well, this, this is what we have to do. Um, and, and the grandmother especially, and, and Carol, are, have been in that position most of their lives. These are the things that we have to do to make this right. Now, what, let me know what I have to do, and I will do it, whatever it is. 
And Carol will take money from her, her mother to get the lawyer if she has to. She doesn't want to, but she will, right? Um, Carol will try to get money from Russ to get money for the lawyer if she has to. And she will, because she's going to somehow try to protect her daughter. Um, no matter what happens, she's going to try to protect her daughter. Um, and she understands the situation that they're in. She's, I, I think, under no illusion that Angel is innocent. Um, I don't think she even, I don't think she even wishes that Angel's innocent. I think she says, this is the situation we're in. This is what we have to do um, to get, I guess, the best result. Um, and she does it, um, which is, I think is why I've got her in taking the point of view sections for a lot of that, the trial section there, because it's up to her to get all this done. And she's, of course, she's never done it before. She doesn't have the means to do it. And yet, this is what she's tasked with, an almost impossible task. I think I try to give the point of view to the person who has the impossible task at that moment so that you have this sort of the maximum urgency of emotion. You know, that question of, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right choice? But whereas before, earlier in the book, it's wrong choice, wrong choice, wrong choice, wrong choice. But in the end, Carol makes a lot of right choices in the end. I think Russ makes a lot of right choices in the end. Um, yeah. even, even, even Angel in the end makes a lot of right choices, but only when she's forced to. She doesn't want to make the right choice. She never wants to make the right choice. She's always going to make the most flamboyant, romantic choice that portrays her as the person in control or in power. Yeah, except, and here I, again, I'm treading lightly, until at the end, there were certain aspects of it that reminded me of, Jack Nicholson and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in the sense that, you know, you had this person who was bubbly, humorous, enjoyed life, even though there were things. And then because of an experience, Marie has to cope for the rest of her life with the fact that she doesn't have what she once had, you know? Yeah, and, and Angel, you know, because she's Angel, um, she becomes a different person and she escapes. Right. She goes off to another life. Yeah, but is she happy? Well, we don't See, know. That, 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 we, don't, we don't know her. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying about the book. You know, I, I'm still wondering today. I'll, <laughs> I'll be walking along thinking, I wonder, you know, she doesn't smile. She doesn't smile. But she's out and she's got a good life, but she's, just, she's, she's at the grocery store. Just shopping, you know, maybe with a toddler walking near her, you know, is she a murderer? Yeah. Maybe. You don't know. You have no, you have no idea what history these people are carrying around with them. Um, but I, I think, I mean, Angel understands that she needs to shed that past and she does. Uh, whereas Marie understands that she has to remember the past and she does. She does, but she, the life she has is not her fault. And and there's no blame on her, you know? I mean, there's no blame. It's not, none of it's her fault. None of it at all. That's but it's, about. well, I mean, it's, it's the price. It, it's, it's one of the prices that the people within the family have to pay um, for what happened, what somebody else did in the family. And that's, that's classic small town stuff. Right? Yeah, it's, it's like just, uh, Shirley Jackson, the lottery or something almost. Exactly. Well, I mean, I, I've I tried to pattern it a little bit after we've always lived in the castle. You know, which the two girls, they're from this family that is looked down on. They're, they're stuck in this house. And no one quite knows what's going on in there. Uh, they know something horribly bad happened. And it sticks to everybody in the household. Um, but it sticks to Marie the most. And partially because she doesn't leave there. I mean, she's stuck there. So even her students, years years after the fact, you know, whisper and all the rumors that they've heard. It was funny because you are who you are, how you had to stick baseball in there. Is there? Oh, the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. Derek, yeah. Jeter's, Derek Jeter's, the Phillies pitcher, they can't figure him out. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm Philadelphia, so I'm thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> it's easy to figure out the Phillies. <laughs> oh, hey, they were good that year. They were really good that year. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were. I, I knew what year it was going to be set in. I kind of had that year pinned down, uh, which is right after the, the uh, economic crash, the housing market crash there, because I knew it was going to be even more depressed in a way. Um, and it, it's funny because in that area, there's that split. And it's, it's, 
you know, what communities root for the Yankees, which are you know, the Portuguese, Dominican, and Italian communities vote, you know, root for the Yankees, where you know, the Irish, the whites, um, the, the sort of the, the, the upper end people, um, the, the richer people um, root for Boston, for the Red Sox there. So it kind of made sense to throw those two clashes in there. Because I'm always looking for character contrast um, between the two. So we hear again and again, about you know, how the Red Sox do and what are they doing there from the father, like he's a Pats fan, the Sox fan and all that. You know, so the other way to go was with the Yankees. And I knew, I mean, it's World Series time, so he's gonna throw that in there. The mother's excited about the Yankees. Um, uh, Birdie's father, his deceased, was a huge Yankee fan. One of the very few things that she has from him is his baseball cap. Um, so there is a, um, that family connection, that family tie, you know, that, that holds them together. Um, the Yankees, the food and just having all the family together is there. So I thought it was just kind of a fun thing for me as a Red Sox fan to show every all these Yankees fans being so excited about being in the World Series. It's the last time they won actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's the last time they won the World Series. 2009. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. This, this dying it was well, yeah, not another semi tragedy. And the other one is even <laughs> Even that party she had for the game was kind of a tragedy, you know. She got yeah. all this food ready, and then just the, the game didn't work out. And she goes, "Well, it's just the first, you know. It's just the first inning, you know. It's just okay. you know. just one home run, just another home run." Yeah, yeah. But I also, I mean, here she is. She's just broken up, just broke up with Miles, and she thinks for the final time because uh, they've gone through all the Swiss stuff. Um, and you know, she she goes into this big you know, big setting where we're going to have a big time here. We're going to have fun, you know, and she has to put on this face. And so much of the book is about people putting on faces when, again, that, that interior, you know, feeling versus exterior, you know, speech or exterior manner. Um, I mean, inside, she's just, she's just dying, you know, and she has to go through this whole thing. Um, so I, I fear that was a nice way to do it. And also to bring in more of the family there. Um, I, I needed to make yeah. Bernie very very present um because I, I knew that at some point we would lose her um and that was going to be a, a shock for the reader i think um, that after a certain point she just is not coming back um, so i wanted to make sure that the reader had enough of her um, and the people around her again and then i think that's why i start with her uh, she shows up before angel shows up um, in, in, term, in terms of point of view um, and that's the first leap that Marie has to make. How does she imagine herself into Bertie? Um, impossible. Bertie goes through a lot in this book. Even, even in her sports endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Forgot about yeah. It. You know, it's funny. There's, you know, this, there's this ethnicity theme in the book, but you do it really subtly, which is great because it's not an element of the book really at all. You know what I mean? It's... It's an element of the setting, uh, right? It's, it's definitely an element of the setting, and it, you know, it has been for you know, hundreds of years. Um, and the Portuguese community and the Portuguese American community there as well, and it, you know, Angel and Marie are in fact half Portuguese um, because their father was Portuguese, um, and and Bertie is Portuguese, um, but they live kind of an Anglo life. Um, you know, the grandmother has never liked the Portuguese side, so it kind of just tries to cut it off there and. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's an extra little, I don't know, an extra little grain of sand in the oyster, I think, and and also connection or disconnection between the two girls. Are they the same? You know, are are, are Birdie and, and Angel the same? Will they do whatever they can to to secure love for themselves, however they want to get it? Um, yeah, throughout the book, they're they're kind of mirrored that way. Um, yeah, and I have to say. I don't know, maybe I'm uh, canceling myself, but when Angel finds out what's going on, it's and that bitch, that bitch, that bitch, and you repeat that word over and over again, and there's this visceral reaction to something that could be thought through, but there's no thinking through at all. It's just that one word. Well, know? I mean, a birdie has transgressed she's trespassed she's taking this thing from angel and the thing isn't necessarily miles it's the way that angel sees herself 
uh, Angel's power comes from being able to land Miles and control Miles and do with Miles whatever she wishes. And Birdie totally undermines that and pulls that out from underneath her. Um, Angel doesn't have a whole lot else going for her in a way. Her, her self-esteem is, is tied far too much to how her friends see her at school, like so many people in high school. Um, yeah. And th their peer group basically, <laughs> what's the word for it? determines how they feel about themselves um, and so when she's made a laughing stock at school when the pictures come out on facebook of, of you know, birdie and miles you know being together i mean she's she's totally destroyed utterly destroyed and she has to somehow claw back and find a way to, to regain her power um and, and she does it in completely the wrong way but i think it's understandable the the anger and the hatred that she feels for her um, she wants to think that what happens in the end is an accident, but um, at, at times she comes, she comes to accept it and, and admit it, I think, I think briefly here and there. Um, yeah. So you wonder about it too. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think she's a, a, a terrible person. Um, I think she's very hurt. I think he's very, very hurt there um, and just didn't know what else to do. Uh, well, it's a crime. Of any, any, anything, anything except that, right? Anything except that would be acceptable. Uh, but it's not. And afterwards, I mean, she tries to tries to see it in some sort of romantic light. And 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 throughout the. Probably her last 30 or 40 pages with when she's still in contact somewhat with Miles, she seems to be playing some sort of tragic romantic role. Um, rather than sort of authentically living it. Um, she, she's very um, self-conscious throughout that period of how she's going to look. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, Bertie wasn't happy with the pictures either. No one was happy with them. But I, you know, I wouldn't want to be a kid today. I, I had enough trouble when I was a kid back then. I, I certainly wouldn't want to be a kid today with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. It'd be horrible. I mean, it could be horrible. Yeah, yeah. If you if you are at the center of something negative like that, yeah, it can be can be very very terrifying and awful. Um, yeah, and Angel Angel doesn't want to be in that position anymore, so she she fights her way out of it, and and you know at the expense of others. On the other side of it is when it's self inflicted, like a, a girl a girl who was working for me at the bookstore committed suicide, and oh she was sixteen. Sorry. Yeah. Lord. Yeah, and but I told this psychiatrist that it happened, and he goes, "Yeah, tell me something new." It was like, "Yeah, yeah. This is what he sees: sixteen-year-old girl, girls killing themselves because somebody said something or posted a picture." And it's just, uh, you know, I could be, an, you know, an old man and just say, "I can't believe what the world's coming to." Actually, I can't believe what the world's coming to, but that's just today. No, yeah, well, I mean. You know, and I, I think I think it was true 20, 30, 40 years ago as well. I mean, what, how do we see, how do we feel that we're worth something? Um, how, how do we understand our own worth? And I think that's maybe the problem that Carol has and even her husband you now has, her ex-husband uh, Frank has. Um, how do we see our own self-worth when the rest of the world tells us we're not worth anything? And I, I think Angel, you know, because she was beautiful and athletic, um, she was told that she was worth that. And once that was taken away from her, you know, that she was desirable, um, she's like, now, now, what am I worth? I'm worth nothing. Um, and and Maria has never been told she's worth anything. You know, uh, or that's the way she feels, at least. That's the way she feels that she's seen in the world. It's like in your lifetime, you meet maybe people that you could count on the fingers of both hands that don't vibrate. They just are what they are. And they have that feeling of self-worth because they're not narcissistic. They just know what they are. Like my friend, when he was four years old, he knew he wanted to become a cardiologist. I mean, wow. it would be, I know, it would be great to be that non-vibrating, integrated person. And I've always, I'm not envious necessarily or jealous of them, but I admire the fact that for whatever reason, whether it's because of their parents or because they just turned out that way. They're the chemicals in their brain that they just are solid. 
I, right. I'm not explaining it right, but you know what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah. and I, again, I think that comes down to, you know, how, how we see ourselves, and what, what are we worth, right? And uh, I, I, am, I am worth something because, because I do this, because I am this, because I'm with this person there. And now who am I now that I'm no longer doing this or I'm no longer with this person? Um, I, th I think most of us are in that, again, that, that ocean state, right? Oh and yeah, you gotta show that. Yeah, yeah, ocean state and that, that we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're kind of, especially when love comes into the picture, romantic love, we're in this, this tumultuous circumstance where we don't quite know who we are or what we're doing or why. Um, we're, we're moved by our own emotions and, and we're, we're uncertain, but we do these extreme crazy things. Um, and and it, it means so much to us. Um, so, I mean, it can be a, a creative force, it can be a destructive force, um, but it's definitely a force that's, I think, out of our control or when we feel most out of control. Um, you know, and this, this the fluctuations of romantic love, um, which I, I think is what I was trying to, to work with. Yeah, I mean, mostly. I mean, I, I know Carol's looking for some sort of worth in her relationships. Uh, her romantic love because her, her work situation she's you know she knows what she's doing at work but it's not fulfilling for her um yeah but she has courageous moments at work too yeah it, well she's that kind of person there and that's the yeah. thing is you no know, and she's i think at one point uh, marie says she was smart in everything except for love right she was pretty solid with everything except for love and, and then there's drinking and involved as well but um yeah and that early on um i think that's that first paragraph now, when I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. Um, my mother said she was in love, <laughs> you know, like it was an excuse. Yeah. I didn't know what love was then, you know, yeah. but I do now, she She's says. Marie, Marie opens up and says that, you know, and, you know, what is love? Um, and, and, and Marie's trying to figure that out, I think. You know, I, since you held the cover up and um, so here it is. What, there you go. Yeah, and and the thing about it is, is that I, I because of the bookstore, I talked to everybody about this because the, everyone who listens to this has heard me say this a thousand times. People say you can't judge a book by its cover, but everyone who comes into my bookstore, without exception, without exception, <laughs> unless they know what they want, are are going to look at the cover first, which is why publishers pick the covers generally. And this cover is great, and it gives this feeling. You describe it and then tell me whether you picked it, whether you got to vet it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, well, I, I, I got to pick it or I got, I was, I was in the process of picking it. Uh, we knew we wanted something that was ocean or beachy type themed, but I didn't want it to be a bright sunny beach type thing to make it look like this is sort of, you know, a light beach read. I want it to be a little more brooding, a little darker. Um, and so we are looking through some of uh, Joel Meyerowitz's photos from Cape Light and you know, he's one of the great photographers of the, of the East Coast there. And we came up with like five or six of them that, that seemed to fit uh, a little bit of starkness, foreboding. It's a little Edward Hopperness to it. Yeah. I um, and, and we found this one with the moon in it. Um, and when the uh, designer came up with it and had the moon stuck there between the A and the N up there, it's, it seemed just kind of perfect for me. Um, it, it does. It's a, it, I, we really, really liked it, and, and Mr. Marowitz was very, very gracious in letting us use it, because usually he doesn't let people use his photography. Um, so we're very happy that he is, he's able to give it to us. And it's funny how front porches always have a great deal of meaning, you know, in movies and books. Lots of things happen on front porches. And um, what we were, you were saying is uh, Hopper's that one picture where you're, it's the beautiful yellow light and the house is, the door is open and it's going out impossibly onto the sea. And I have that <laughs> hanging up somewhere in this house. But yeah, it, that's exactly right. Oh yeah, and the, ep okay, the other thing people look at is epigraphs. And this was strange what you did because your epigraphs are angel. You yeah, know? yeah, angel, angel Olson. Well, I also, I dedicate the book to her as well. I, mean, a lot I know. Of a lot of her music was was um, inspiring. I think she was sort of the muse for this book. Um, usually, there's a, a soundtrack 
Um, when, I'm, when I'm writing a book, I have some sort of soundtrack that I'm listening to that puts me in the mood to write about the characters. Um, and her writing, uh, especially about romantic love and loss, um, is really, really amazing. Uh, she's, a, she's a great, great uh, songwriter. Um, and so I, I figured that, you know, I had already come up with, with Angel and Birdie and all that. It just kind of fit together. I was like, oh, okay, that's all right. I'll, you know, I'll use that, that connection there. And then the epigraphs it seemed to me just kind of right. Um, those two particular songs of hers and just their styles. Um, also in, in the book, I think there's 53 song titles uh, from Angel Olsen sort of threaded through the book. Um, and a lot of, a lot of her, her great lines are in there as well. So it's an homage to her as well. So a juxtaposition of my research for this interview is listening to her music, at, at music and watching the ninth inning of the game. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, well, anyway, so it was, it's, a, it's a great book like all of yours are. And thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I'll, it'll be on the front table uh, in six days, something like that. Yes. Well, today, today was going to be the pub date, uh, but it got pushed back because of uh, shipping problems with COVID. So. Yeah, I know. How many times have I heard, uh, you know, supply, supply chain and COVID? And yeah. then there's this, there's this cartoon in the New Yorker where this woman's saying, I wonder how much longer I can use the COVID excuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but they moved the pub day to the Ides of March. Which Ides of March. Perfect, I, perfect I for this book. It's all about betrayal. I know. Um, I already thought that. Beware of the Ides of March. Well, okay. It was great seeing you, Stuart. And hopefully I'll see you again. And if you ever get a chance to make the four and a half hour drive over here, I was looking at your tour. I know it starts at your favorite bookshop in Pittsburgh. Indeed, and, the White Well. Great yeah. bookstore. Yeah, it is a great bookstore. Um, yeah, but hopefully you'll get down here sometime. I look forward well, to it. Definitely. Well, maybe maybe with the paperback, maybe with the next one. Never know. Okay. I'll, I'll stay in touch then. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. Sure, Stuart. Nice seeing you again. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Go Bucks.